So I guess we'll get started. Uh, I'm Arnold Postlethwaite uh, from the University of Tennessee in Memphis, and uh, this talk today is on drugs uh, that cause scleroderma and or morphia. Uh, it's an interesting area and one that uh, has to be updated periodically because as new drugs come out and are being used, uh, the more experience we have with agents that come out, uh, the more we know about their potential uh, to cause uh, other diseases or aggravate uh, other conditions. And uh, that certainly is true with systemic sclerosis. Um, there was, um, <clears throat> when I was uh, in training, uh, attention was focused on ergotamine-like agents that were used to treat um, migraine headaches and uh, it produced uh, fibrosis in some patients and actually uh, the ergotamines were used as an animal model in a laboratory uh, to study fibrosis. Uh, then came uh, bleomycin, uh, which was a drug used to treat uh, cancer and it was associated with development in some people of uh, systemic sclerosis very similar to the uh, natural disease. And uh, as an outgrowth of that uh, experience, uh, a lot of investigators have adapted, including our laboratory, uh, the bleomycin model in mice, uh, which if you repeatedly inject uh, under the skin bleomycin, you get an area of fibrosis that resembles uh, the skin biopsies in patients with systemic sclerosis. Also, if you instill the bleomycin into the lungs of the mice, uh, they develop pulmonary fibrosis that uh, in many respects resembles the uh, interstitial lung disease and uh, fibrosis we see in systemic sclerosis. So the bleomycin model uh, we owe a lot to because uh, it has been used to test out some of the therapeutic agents that are now uh, in clinical trials in scleroderma and uh, that's one of the first uh, models that at which uh, new agents are tested and some of the uh, trials that are going on right now those were demonstrated to be effective in either the skin and or fibrosis uh, of the lungs model of the disease. So this requires us to uh, keep uh, up as, as doctors uh, and treat the total patients uh, and not just focus on the particular uh, area of uh, disease that the drug was uh, uh, in, uh, designed to treat because uh, we, we have these other things that come up with, with agents as the longer we use them. So we'll be reviewing some of this. So uh, the chemo uh, drugs or chemotherapeutic drugs uh, are probably the largest group that over the years have been shown to induce uh, systemic sclerosis, lung fibrosis, or localized uh, scleroderma-like uh, changes. Uh, bleomycin, as we mentioned, was uh, discovered in the late uh, 70s and published in, uh, in the 1980s uh, to show to uh, cause increased production uh, uh, by co of collagen by fibroblasts uh, from humans uh, when placed in culture, and uh, that was sort of an in vitro demonstration of the uh, potential of the, uh, uh, of it to uh, cause uh, fibrosis and, uh, and systemic sclerosis. Another group are the taxanes, uh, which have been used a lot in uh, treating breast cancer. Uh, this ataxyl and uh, paclitaxel uh, have been reported to cause uh, scleroderma-like uh, fibrosis of the skin, uh, most commonly in the legs, and uh, so the literature really emphasizes these particularly tend to be lower extremity uh, fibrosis that develops uh, in the legs. There's also uh, uh, sunetanab, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that causes uh, a hand and foot syndrome uh, that have scleroderma-like changes in the hands and in the feet. And this is induced by uh, this agent. And uh, uh, there's also a report by uh, capacitabin, uh, which can also cause uh, diffuse systemic sclerosis. The uh, leg perfusion by melphalan uh, for a melanoma in a leg uh, was reported to cause uh, localized scleroderma-like changes 
in that per, uh, extremity that was perfused with that chemotherapeutic drug. And then uh, another uh, agent, uh, gamcitrabine, uh, has caused lower extremity scleroderma uh, skin changes also. So uh, this is a, a very, uh, you know, class of drugs that uh, uh, several of which uh, have been reported. So the uh, uh, are, are, are commonly used and uh, patients who have uh, cancer uh, can get these changes uh, if some of these agents are used. Now interferon alpha uh, was used up until recently to treat uh, hepatitis C. And the use of interferon alpha uh, was shown to uh, produce uh, a Raynaud's phenomenon and uh, development of limited systemic sclerosis uh, in some patients uh, after starting the uh, alpha interferon therapy for hepatitis C. And uh, also another uh, synthetic interferon alpha uh, called interferon alpha con A uh, used to treat hepatitis C was also shown to uh, induce uh, a similar syndrome of fibrosis uh, of a limited uh, form. Interferon beta, a treatment of multiple sclerosis, uh, and a patient was also uh, shown to uh, to trigger the development of localized uh, systemic or uh, limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis, uh, which uh, developed uh, one month after starting the interferon beta treatment. Interferon alpha has multiple effects uh, on the immune system, and there's evidence of interferon alpha abnormality uh, metabolism in patients with systemic sclerosis and also uh, with lupus erythematosus. So perhaps the interferon alpha can, when given as a therapy, will trigger some of these uh, pathways that uh, are abnormal in patients who have uh, systemic sclerosis and sort of can mimic uh, those abnormalities and allow the systemic sclerosis to develop. So uh, there's a couple reports of localized uh, uh, scleroderma or morphia at the injection sites of uh, vitamin K1 and of uh, vitamin B12. Uh, and these uh, developed uh, at the site of the injection, repeated injections of, of vitamin B12 and uh, vitamin K1 uh, that uh, have been reported. Uh, the K1 was reported by two different uh, groups, so that is uh, when it's done by two different groups, is lends more credibility to that actually as being um, a true observation. Now, the other area is very interesting with regards to uh, the uh, cont oral contraceptive. So, Yasmin, which is uh, ethanyl estradiol uh, plus uh, uh, drospirinone, is an oral contraceptive. Uh, and it's used uh, rapidly converted long-standing clinically benign Raynaud's phenomenon in a patient to a very aggressive uh, Raynaud's phenomenon that was associated with uh, fingertip ulcerations and edema of the hands that progressed to fibrosis of the fingers sclerodactyly and also caused the development of the anti-centromere antibodies, which are uh, the hallmark uh, of uh, uh, limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis. Interesting, estradiol was shown by Dr. Figele Bostic uh, to uh, be elevated in the serum of uh, patients with systemic sclerosis. And uh, when added to cultures of uh, fibroblasts, uh, the estradiol uh, stimulated the development of a fibroblast uh, phenotype or change in the appearance and production of collagen and other matrix prote proteins, including fibronectin. Uh, as a uh, direct effect of the estradiol. So uh, I think uh, this is uh, an interesting observation that uh, sort of in the laboratory, estradiol has been shown also to be associated with uh, uh, inducing a fibroblast uh, phenotype that we see in systemic sclerosis uh, skin biopsies. Uh, there's uh, estradiol, uh, uh, you know, is, is increased and in, in, uh, obviously in the females, uh, normally and in, in estrogen hormones, and uh, the female patients are more susceptible uh, to getting systemic sclerosis than male uh, patients, and this may be uh, at, uh, you know, inducing some of the uh, background 
uh, changes that allow this to help in, uh, more in, uh, in the females uh, than males. So uh, ergotamine uh, compounds were, have been associated with fibrosis uh, in different sites, including the heart valves, the lungs, uh, the lining of the chest, the pleura, called the pleura, and also blood vessels. Uh, and uh, this has been reported by several different groups. And uh, methosurgide, which is uh, related to uh, ergotamine, uh, causes a similar fibrosis and uh, induced a scleroderma-like uh, change in uh, bilateral ex uh, extremities that was uh, reversible pretty much uh, with the discontinuation uh, of its use. So these uh, compounds, the ergotamines and methosurgide, uh, induce uh, vascular constriction, particularly in arterials uh, of the body. And so you have a decreased oxygenation of tissues and uh, a lot of observations over the years have shown that decreased oxygen is uh, one of the things that will cause fibroblasts to start making a lot of collagen. And so this may be at the basis of this, the vasoconstriction that occurs uh, triggers the uh, onset of uh, increased collagen production uh, by the fibroblasts. This is probably what's operative also in idiopathic rhinos where you get spasm of the blood vessels in the hands and you start getting thickening of skin there, uh, again, the decreased oxygen uh, tension due by the vasoconstriction uh, is associated with development of, of fibrosis. So uh, the other categories are a somewhat miscellaneous group of drugs that sort of over the years have uh, been associated with uh, observations in the clinic of uh, associating with the development of scleroderma. Uh, and uh, the anticonvulsant drug, uh, ethosuximide, uh, induced a scleroderma, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus and scleroderma uh, that reversed uh, after discontinuing uh, its use. Uh, the ACE inhibitor blood pressure medication, uh, falsinopril, uh, induced scleroderma and eosinophilic fasciitis, and this is reported in the Journal of Rheumatology. Uh, we obviously uh, use ACE inhibitors uh, to treat the renal crisis uh, uh, in patients with uh, uh, renal crisis with uh, systemic sclerosis. Uh, so uh, uh, this uh, particular uh, type of uh, ACE inhibitor is the only one that's been reported so far to, uh, to be associated with, with uh, inducing uh, scleroderma and eosinophilic fasciitis. There's, uh, an osteoporosis drug, and patients with systemic sclerosis do have osteoporosis at an increased uh, rate. And uh, this particular agent, uh, balisatabneb, uh, induced morphia in a woman with osteoporosis. And uh, it regressed very rapidly after uh, this agent was, was discontinued. So that's one of the things that we look for in these reports. If you stop the drug, does, uh, does a condition or uh, fibrosis tend to reverse? And uh, that's pretty good evidence that indeed uh, it caused a particular fibrosis. Uh, so a patient uh, with Parkinson disease uh, on uh, carbidopa uh, developed morphia after taking uh, the supplement 5-hydroxytryptophan. Uh, and so this uh, combinations together were, th were thought to be uh, 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 causes of the development of this uh, morphia-like uh, change uh, in this particular patient. So there have been uh, environmental agents over the years uh, which, uh, you know, are not necessarily drugs, but they're certainly uh, uh, are, are reason to be concerned because there has been uh, a long history of uh, report of uh, uh, Patients working in coal mines exposed to uh, silica uh, dust, uh, for example, in western Pennsylvania, uh, Jerry Rodden and his group at Pittsburgh uh, showed that the patients uh, who uh, had systemic sclerosis, uh, those who worked in the coal mines uh, had a higher incidence of systemic sclerosis than uh, ones uh, who were not working in the coal mines. And there was increased incidence of uh, scleroderma in western Pennsylvania, uh, probably due to the fact that a lot of these uh, patients uh, 
had worked in, in, in uh, coal mine. Uh, so silica dust is also uh, a, a concern with uh, people who work with sand and uh, living in the desert. And uh, there's increased fibrosis in the lungs associated with exposure to, uh, to sand in these situations. Uh, sand blasters uh, and uh, uh, even uh, uh, people living in the desert uh, have a high incident, higher incidence of pulmonary fibrosis uh, due to exposure to the, uh, to the uh, silica in the uh, sand. Uh, there's also uh, currently uh, with hydraulic fracturing, uh, there's a lot of sand uh, that's used uh, in the process and uh, sort of uh, areas of a bow or so uh, downwind where they're doing hydraulic fracturing there's increased uh, sand particles uh, in the uh, atmosphere, and I guess time will tell whether this is going to trigger also increased pulmonary fibrosis as a result of inhaling this, and also the workers uh, who are doing that. That remains to be uh, seen, but certainly if uh, our experience with exposure to silica in uh, coal mines and in dust uh, uh, before uh, suggests that may be a, a problem. Now, breast augmentation with silicon uh, has been reported, uh, and it's a controversial area, whether it actually can trigger, trigger uh, the actual full-blown systemic sclerosis and autoimmune diseases. Uh, so there's reports both ways uh, about that. Uh, I just this past uh, Wednesday in, in our clinic uh, saw a patient who had had silicon injections in multiple areas of the body. Uh, to try to improve appearance. And this particular patient uh, did not develop, uh, you know, Raynaud's, esophageal dysmotility, some of the things you would associate with early scleroderma. Uh, but this patient did start developing shortness of breath, and it was found that the silica had really, uh, particles had lodged apparently from the blood from these other areas uh, into one of the uh, lower lobes in the lung. And the lung had on high-resolution CT, the changes of uh, interstitial lung disease and fibrosis. Uh, so that is a concern, uh, multiple injections of silicon uh, for uh, appearance and cosmetic uh, changes uh, could uh, per perhaps uh, induce uh, also pulmonary fibrosis if uh, these get into the uh, bloodstream in high amounts. So uh, organic chemicals. The aromatic hydrocarbons, uh, such as uh, toluene and uh, uh, benzene, xylene, uh, aromatic uh, mixes of these are used as uh, cleaning agents uh, by mechanics and also in the paint, uh, auto paint industry. And these uh, have been associated with increased uh, incidence of systemic sclerosis and uh, pulmonary fibrosis uh, developing uh, in these uh, particular individuals. There's also a, 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 a white spirit, which is a, 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 a used to dilute paint. And uh, this also has been associated with, uh, uh, with development of uh, uh, morphia and uh, systemic sclerosis-like symptoms. Uh, aliphatic uh, chlorinated hydrocarbons, uh, such as vinyl chloride, uh, was reported uh, back in the 70s to uh, people working in the vinyl chloride industry. Uh, had an increased incidence of systemic sclerosis. And so vinyl chloride uh, is one of the other uh, agents uh, that has been associated with uh, development of systemic sclerosis. And some of the other derivatives of that, uh, such as trichloroethylene, uh, perchloroethylene, and naphthalene uh, hexane, uh, are also uh, associated with developing uh, of uh, systemic sclerosis. So uh, epoxy resins, uh, again, in paint, uh, these are used, and uh, uh, these are uh, potential uh, causes of, uh, of scleroderma. And uh, the biologic, uh, uh, biogenic amines, uh, uh, methyl uh, phenyl adenine uh, has been associated uh, uh, with, with development of scleroderma. Now, uh, a number of drugs. Uh, we talked about bleomycin, obviously, and uh, some of the other uh, agents, but uh, uh, appetite suppressant drugs uh, and the uh, pendazoacin and 1,5-hydroxy uh, uh, tryptophan 
Uh, carbidopa, we mentioned uh, earlier, uh, these have been associated with developing uh, scleroderma. Uh, toxic oil syndrome uh, occurred uh, in Spain. Uh, some oil was uh, put up in, in containers that contained a, a chemical that uh, has not been really identified, but uh, patients who drank this oil, uh, put this oil on their salad and on their food uh, came down with the systemic sclerosis disease. Uh, so uh, uh, fortunately that is, uh, uh, has not been allowed and, uh, anymore in terms of uh, uh, the exposure of the oil to these, uh, these chemicals in the processing or, or shipping of it. L-tryptophan uh, is also a potential uh, initiator of systemic sclerosis uh, and uh, uh, eosinophilic fasciitis uh, can also develop as a result of these. So what we've done is to uh, uh, review uh, the causes of uh, systemic sclerosis with the drugs. Uh, there is uh, also uh, some reports of statins uh, which are used to uh, control uh, cholesterol met metabolism. And uh, uh, some of the statins uh, have been shown to be associated with development of interstitial lung disease. There was a study done with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease uh, in which they uh, looked at, uh, it's a huge multicenter study across the United States, and they looked at the patients who had been on various statins versus those who didn't, and the incidence of interstitial lung disease was uh, doubled in patients getting the uh, statin. Anyway, so uh, to prove that, they actually went to the bleomycin lung fibrosis model. And if you, like I said in the beginning, if you instill in the uh, trachea of the mice uh, a little bit of bleomycin, they develop over the course of a week or two uh, interstitial lung disease. So when they took and put some of these statins, uh, treated the mice with it, they developed rip roaring fibrosis in the lungs with the bleomycin. And so that was an in vitro demonstration in the, in the mouse model of lung fibrosis that the statins can induce uh, facilitate development of fibrosis. So these are, these are concerns. The statins are being used widely and prescribed. Uh, I gave a whole talk, I think, last year on the statins and uh, at this meeting, and uh, it can trigger a variety of autoimmune diseases because it sort of acts like uh, what we call an immune adjuvant. In other words, it helps potentiate the immune response in some people for by some unknown reason. And it's triggered uh, the onset of uh, uh, lupus-like disease. We see patients who develop uh, polymyositis, dermatomyositis-like disease with it. Uh, a lot of patients have muscle aches and pains with them when they're on this. And a uh, particular type of necrotizing uh, myopathy develops that was described by the group at Hopkins uh, with the statin agent. So in addition to that, we have also the potential for interstitial lung fibrosis as well as scleroderma developing, and there has been some reports of these happening. So I apparently am missing a slide. Uh, one also talked about the anti-TNF agents uh, that uh, patients with rheumatoid arthritis or psori psoriatic arthritis get this, and one patient with uh, psoriatic arthritis uh, develop morphia shortly after uh, starting an anti-TNF agent. Uh, and uh, uh, this was reversed when the uh, anti-TNF agent was stopped. And in rheumatoid arthritis, uh, we see occasionally interstitial lung disease uh, precipitating uh, by the use of the anti-TNF agents. Uh, there was a, a clinical trials of anti-TNF agents uh, like Humira, Embryo, in scleroderma uh, several years ago, and it was shown not to in, uh, cause uh, improvement in the scleroderma, so they have not been uh, adopted as a treatment for, for, uh, for this disease. Uh, but uh, there is a potential uh, patients who are getting uh, the anti-TNF agents to develop uh, scleroderma and or interstitial lung disease uh, from, uh, from what's been shown. Uh, I think, uh, at this point, we will uh, sort of open it up for questions, uh, and uh, uh, because we don't have the slide, uh, the last slides, uh, we are uh, 
we'll uh, sort of open it up to uh, any questions you may have about uh, these agents. So I, I think that it's important as patients or if you're caregivers and you, uh, is to uh, be aware of some of these drugs that uh, could uh, maybe make the disease worse. Uh, there's not a lot of literature on patients with scleroderma getting these, disease, getting these agents, but mostly just normal people with cancer or whatever getting them and then coming down with a uh, fibrosis in the lungs or in the skin. Uh, and uh, these are, uh, but I think if these agents are going to be used, you need to be aware of this. And also, uh, again, the uh, hematology oncology people may not be aware of all of these uh, conditions in which uh, uh, the, the uh, fibrosis may develop as a result of use of some of these agents. So unfortunately, as physicians, uh, uh, we tend to sometimes get too restricted and focused on the particular disease where we're experts at treating and sort of ignore the whole patient. And that's always a mistake. We treat the whole patient. And I think that's rheumatologists. That's one of the reasons I went into rheumatology, is the rheumatologists tend to uh, look at the whole patient and be aware of all of these because multi-systems are involved in most of the diseases we treat. So at that point, I'll open it up to questions that any of you might have. Check, check. If you have a question, please use the microphone. Thank you. Um, on the fourth slide, about uh, vitamin B12 injections, and I was wondering if you could just um, elaborate on that a little bit more um, as to perhaps why B12 was being used in those instances, and just um, with kind of the growing trend, B vitamin B12 has kind of been seen as like recreational sure. uh, um, well, in terms of like spas and things like that using it. So just what, what are your thoughts around that topic? What's the last uh Thoughts about what? Um, that vitamin B12 injections are being used more commonly in like medical spas. Um, it's like right. seeing as a shot for energy use. Right. Um, and just what, what are your thoughts about yeah. that? Well, vitamin B12 Thank you. has a long history. Uh, it originally, the real use of it is if you have uh, stomach uh, malabsorption problems with the stomach. Uh, and uh, uh, if you can't absorb vitamin B12, you would develop uh, megaloblastic anemia, pernicious anemia. So patients with pernicious anemia, and I had a great aunt who had that, and she was encouraged to eat liver, <laughs> so she ate a lot of liver. Uh, at that point, they didn't have the B12 injections. Uh, so it's prim uh, vitamin B12 is needed uh, to make uh, normal red blood cells, and if you don't have vitamin B12 and you're deficient, you will make abnormal uh, red blood cells that uh, are larger, and they tend to be destroyed more readily, so you develop uh, a low hematocrit and get anemia. We will see the same thing if we use methotrexate and don't give folic acid. We can induce also the meg what's called megaloblastic anemia. So vitamin B12, uh, unless you have uh, you know, pernicious anemia, which goes along with achlorhydria in your stomach. You don't make acid to absorb B12. Uh, there, there really should not be a, a reason to, to give B12. If you eat a regular diet, you will, you will certainly get uh, B12 uh, in it. And I, I don't know what the mechanism is. I, I guess, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's a f local inflammation, uh, repeated injections. Of, of certain compounds will cause fibrosis to develop because it induces a type of inflammation that's followed by fibrosis. Thank you. Thank you, doctor, for sharing all the information. Question specifically about the medication Darvacet. Um, I had lots of migraines in college. Um, and then later developed uh, shortly after then getting married and being on um, oral contraceptive uh, scleroderma. And just wondering if Darvacet has been one of those medications that could be a potential uh, Darvacet trigger. does not come up in the literature. I did a pretty thorough search. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, Darvon and uh, I guess acetaminophen is, is in with it. I took some of that too earlier when it, when it was readily available. Uh, for uh, headaches and aches and pains, uh, but certainly the uh, the birth control things is is something to be a little concerned about, uh, particularly those that have uh, 
estrogen uh, compounds in them uh, because of the, you know, the work of Dr. Figeli showing that uh, it does directly stimulate uh, the, uh, the fibroblasts. Uh, also, there's effects on the immune system uh, that are, aren't really well understood. Uh, that the, uh, and there's, uh, with the lupus uh, models in mice, uh, they've shown that estrogens potentiate the ability. Actually, male, male mice are more resistant. Uh, C57 black, white male mice are more resistant to develop uh, lupus. But if you castrate them and give them estrogen, they will develop Riproar and lupus. So, uh, so it is a, a compound that uh, has this ability to uh, enhance the immune response, autoimmunity. So... Uh, I think it's, you know, uh, from a survival standpoint, it's good for females to be able to mount this strong immune response to infections, but when it gets sidetracked and you get start making autoimmunity antibodies, then it's, it's, a, it's a downside to it, so. Thank you. And part C2, you also talk about hand-foot syndrome. Is that something um, previous to diagnosis, even after diagnosis? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's a syndrome that starts out with inflammation in the hands and feet and then progresses to fibrosis. Uh, so that is uh, uh, this tyrosine kinase inhibitor uh, was reported to, to show that. But hand-foot syndrome is, is described with a variety of other compounds, but they don't develop the fibrosis type uh, of, of changes uh, necessarily. And about statins, and like you said, it's one of the most prescribed drugs everywhere, right? For people with uh, cholesterol, high cholesterol, and uh, that effect seems pretty concerning. So I wonder if you have any information about the rate of people developing lupus-type uh, illnesses because of statin use? It's uncommon. It's really uncommon. Uh, the studies uh, in, in uh, England, where they have a national health service, looked at, uh, and, they, and they follow everybody and have them in a computer, all uh, their data. They looked at rheumatoid arthritis development uh, over the course of many years. And uh, rheumatoid arthritis, which is an autoimmune disease uh, that we treat, uh, came up twice as often if the patients had a history of being on statins uh, and then developed rheumatoid There was twice the incidence of rheumatoid arthritis in this huge population in Britain uh, that, that took statins. Uh, so, um, and we see, uh, I would say three or four cases a year at University of Tennessee of the necrotizing myopathy that develops uh, with that. And uh, that has uh, been very, very concerting. And also lupus. We, we, we've uh, had a couple patients who have developed uh, lupus syndrome and it's been stopped by our cardiology uh, colleagues are well aware of this and very interested in developing autoimmunity on statins. And so they uh, put these pe patients on a non-statin regimen, and, and uh, it goes away. So, uh, uh, so it is a, it is a concern, but but it's it's uncommon. It's uncommon. If you have have had a heart attack or stroke, and and your cardiologist, primary care thinks you need to be on these for that, certainly you should take it because your risk of developing, you know, a stroke or heart attack if you're not on it or some other treatment. Uh, certainly, I would pursue the option of some other way by a cardiologist who knows the lipid field. Uh, to treat the uh, cholesterol problems with, with other agents, if possible. There's a question in the back of the room. My question has to do with the fact that several of your slides mentioned that when these drugs were stopped, that the, the sclerosis reverted and regressed. Right. Is that any kind of indication, any kind of a way that we can do studies to see if we can find a way to flip off that, uh, that light switch that flipped off when it activated the autoimmunes? That, that is certainly an interesting uh, uh, point to make. And uh, we don't know how a lot of these drugs work. And when they're approved by the FDA, uh, for a particular treatment, that's what they focus on. They don't look at what it does to other systems in, uh, in the body, or else we probably would take forever to get a drug approved. So that's why the FDA has this requirement to report after a drug comes to market and is on the market 
you report any side effects that you think may be associated with that. Uh, so, but it has, you know, like with bleomycin, uh, that particular drug, we've, we've understood a lot about fibrosis by seeing what changes the bleomycin treatment induces in the various genes uh, that control inflammation and fibrosis, and a lot of, uh, of that has been found to be uh, operative in scleroderma patients, same abnormalities in the genes. So I think, yes, if we could uh, take these and particularly go with an animal model that would also develop it, like, like the bleomycin does, uh, we would be able to learn uh, a lot about the pathology of, and pathophysiology of systemic sclerosis and how we might resolve the, the fibrosis. In any of the research that you were uh, investigating, did you happen to notice any antibiotics or vaccinations that triggered an autoimmune response? There's some of the uh, uh, antibiotics that have been associated with, uh, with developing lupus uh, and autoimmunity, but uh, uh, scleroderma, it's not that, uh, I was able to not really find uh, evidence of that in the literature uh, for scleroderma. Uh, but we do have drug-induced lupus that's caused by, uh, by some of the antibiotics. Uh, and uh, the uh, furodantin drugs that are used to treat uh, uh, irritated bladder uh, have been associated with, with triggering uh, lupus also. Uh, but, I, but I think, you know, we need to be, uh, if you have scleroderma, it gets worse when you start some of these antibiotics or all, this is something that you should be... Uh, uh, be aware of that there might be a possibility. Certainly, they, some can induce increased autoimmunity. <laughs>